In the first part of why South Asians die 10 years younger, we covered metabolic syndrome, which is an impaired glucose control, bad fat around and in the organs, and dodgy lipid levels, all abnormally perverse in South Asians. But that's just the icing on the cake. The cake itself is probably cardiovascular disease, and South Asians have it in spades. If there's one thing that worries me in my patients, it's hypertension, because just like insulin resistance, you don't see it or feel it until it causes a problem. The main problem of insulin resistance is diabetes, and the main problem of hypertension is stroke and heart attack. And yes, you guessed it, South Asians have higher levels of blood pressure than their European and even native counterparts. This tends to be worse for males though. In one really interesting study, they found that hypertension was actually low for some South Asian females. Do you know why? They found that the people that had strong community bonds, i.e. the females in this study, did much better. So said another way, not being a loner improved your blood pressure. Win, win. What do you get if you add diabetes and high blood pressure? chronic kidney disease. The excess glucose of diabetes and high blood pressure damages the delicate filtration system of the kidney. And not just that, for South Asians, once they get kidney disease, it gets worse more quickly than other ethnic groups, and it tends to be more severe for this reason, with an earlier requirement for things like dialysis and kidney transplantation. In the first part, we already talked a little bit about the toxic metabolic soup that occurs in South Asians that predisposes them to metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, but that is just the half of it. When it comes to blood markers, South Asians have a very pro-inflammatory environment, including higher levels of things like CRP, leptin, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha, and a highly pro-thrombotic or clot-forming environment with higher levels of things like homocysteine, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, and the LP little a that I already mentioned. Both of these factors are key in ingredients in atherosclerotic CVD, i.e. the risk of heart attacks and stroke massively increases. This topic is even too depressing for me to discuss. I'll just leave you with some facts that I think really do say it all. South Asians make up 25% of the world's population, but they make up 60% of the world's heart disease. South Asians have a fourfold increased risk of arterial vessel disease, which is the precursor for heart attacks and strokes, one of the highest risk factors of any patient group. When South Asians have a test to look into the vessels of the heart, they've been found to have narrower blood vessels, higher grade stenoses or blockages, and multiple vessels affected rather than just one. And when South Asians do get heart disease, they get it about 10 years earlier than other ethnicities. 10 years. And 25% of heart attacks occur under the age of 40, and 50% occur under the age of 50. This is insanely young. I've seen this so many times too, especially in young people that think they're healthy just because they're slim. It just doesn't work like that. If you need a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft, which is an operation to bypass these blocked vessels, South Asians often require these types of operations at a younger age, and they consistently do worse than all other ethnicities. There's also a 40% higher chance of dying from heart attacks amongst South Asians than the average population. All this, and I haven't even mentioned anything about stroke, but as it happens, and as I'm sure you're thinking, South Asia is thought to be the highest contributor to stroke mortality in the world. It accounts for more than 40% of global stroke deaths. Stroke happens in a younger population on average than in other ethnicities, and South Asians are much more likely to die from it. Every single thing I've mentioned above, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the weight, the metabolic syndrome, the insulin resistance, the pro-inflammatory and pro-thrombotic state, all contribute to a devastating burden of heart disease and stroke in this population. And the worst part, there's just so much more. I haven't even touched on the lifestyle factors that contribute to risk. Things like diet, exercise, habits, behaviors. You may even be thinking, well, what about genetics? Am I pre 
predisposed to get these problems? I mean, the short answer is yes, but to a relatively small degree. From what I said in the last video, South Asians have genes that do account for a worse metabolic profile and a higher risk of heart disease and stroke. This is why your GP often asks about your family history and your ethnicity. In fact, the one bit of good news from this whole talk is that our genes are not a loaded gun, especially in this context. Yes, there is a genetic predisposition, but this is variable. For some, it may be weak, and for some, it may be strong. But either way, we can and must do something about it. And actually, this is the main take-home message when talking about genetics. How we live massively influences how our genes are expressed. This is the very basis of epigenetics. All the good things that we know we should be doing affect the way our genes are expressed and thus make a huge difference to how we function daily daily, as well as our risk of disease. In an ideal world, the sensitive tool here would be to know your metabolic profile. What's your weight? What's your blood pressure? What are your bloods like? Including those advanced tests that I mentioned, things like insulin resistance and LP little a, as well as other markers of cardiovascular inflammation. Your family history too, and let's quantify your cardiovascular risk. In some circumstances, even imaging such as coronary artery scan and a score of your disease is incredibly useful too. If you have some of this information and an engaged doctor, you can really understand your risk and aggressively target and personally manage it. The reality though is that most of us don't have this information to hand and we don't even have ready access to a doctor that's interested in risk prediction and mitigation. So as a blunt tool, you need to optimize your habits and your health. Check out my video on five habits to live forever for a primer on this. This is the key, modifying what we can. You can't change your genes or ethnicity, but you can change what you do from dusk till dawn every day. And that's where the battle will be won or lost. Tune in next week to learn a little bit more about the behaviors that make a bad situation worse. Thanks for watching. Till next time, stay healthy.